Amen. Y'all let them know how much you appreciate them leading us this morning. Super blessed by them. And uh, starting a brand new series today. We're calling it Winning the War Within. Now, we need to find in our New Testament Galatians chapter 5. So go ahead, if you'll do that, open up your Bible with me to Galatians chapter 5. How many of you got a Bible? Would you say amen? All right, y'all are ready for some preaching? Say yes. All right, good. Y'all, if y'all will like, you know, help me out, I preach so much better. You know what I'm saying? But when y'all sit there like this, it ain't no good. Come on, sister. That's what I'm talking about. I remember when I was a little kid, right? So I used to uh, be taken by my parents down to South Georgia for Christmas. And whenever we would go to South Georgia for Christmas, uh, we would go to my grandparents' house on my dad's side. And uh, whenever we did this, it was pretty interesting because my uh, ma skipper, that's what we called her, mom, pa skipper. But Ma Skipper used to put a spread of desserts out on a table. Anybody have a grandma like that? So this is how mine rolled. And whenever I would show up as a little kid, we would go in and I would find that dessert table, right? Because every single inch of the table was covered up. But I was looking for one particular dessert. And uh, it was a dessert that if you ever had would radically change your life. I'm just telling you. And uh, my grandma made the best uh, peanut butter chocolate covered balls. Are y'all listening, yeah? Chocolate covered peanut butter balls. I don't think I said that right. Chocolate covered peanut butter balls. But anyway, she put them in this tin. They'd be piled up real high. And, uh, you know, as a little kid, you know, as soon as I saw those, I wanted to reach up and kind of grab one. But as soon as I would do that, I would inevitably hear somebody say, no, nope, you can't have that until after supper, right? You will ruin your appetite. Anybody ever heard this? Like you don't have any other appetites coming, right? But you're going to ruin this one. So anyway, I would be unable to grab one of those chocolate-covered peanut butter balls. But then everybody would leave, and I would kind of be standing in the room in front of the table by myself. So I'm still, you know, I'm caught by these chocolate-covered peanut butter balls, and I really want one. But there's a voice coming inside my head that sounds strangely like my mom's voice. It says, you better not eat that till after supper. But then there's this other voice. I'm not real sure what it sounds like, but it says, but she's not in here. And then a voice will show up and say, well, wait a minute. If you eat that, you're going to ruin your appetite. But then a voice comes in and says, but if I eat that, nobody will ever know. So what do I do? I do what any five or six-year-old boy would do. (laughs) I grab as many as I possibly can. Run in the next room and stuff my face, right? (laughs) There's this internal battle that goes on in the lives of every single follower of Jesus. And many of us face this on a daily basis, right? Because there are some things we know that we're supposed to do, but we don't do them. Or some things that we know we should not be doing, but we find ourselves doing those things. Or maybe we're in a situation in our lives and we know how we should respond, but we've got, you know, kind of like two voices hollering at us. One says, you know, respond this way. The other says, no, 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 respond. There's this battle going on. What did you know as a follower of Jesus You and I who know him personally, that every single day walking on planet earth, there is always going to be a war raging on the inside of us. Matter of fact, Paul the Apostle even describes this war in his own life. And if you think about Paul, Paul the Apostle is considered to be uh, one of the greatest Christians ever, right? If you came to me and said, Levi, like, name top Christian of all time, I'd be like, Paul the Apostle. I mean, he's the man, he walked with the Lord, was used by God, preaching the gospel, planting churches, making a huge impact. You and I are even going to read a letter this morning written by Paul the Apostle. But Paul says in Romans chapter 7, I think what you and I often say of our own lives. (laughs) Listen to his words. He rolls it out like this. He says, what I am doing, I don't understand. For I'm not practicing what I'd like to do, but I'm doing the very thing that I hate. And then he says, for the good that I want to do, I don't do. But instead, I'm practicing the very evil that I do not want. What was Paul describing? He was describing this internal battle that he was facing as a follower of Jesus. He had this internal struggle over doing the right thing and opposing the wrong thing. And oftentimes, as Paul says, he found himself doing the wrong thing. But even though he didn't want to do that. So this battle rages in the life of every single follower of the Lord Jesus. And Paul the Apostle actually describes this in Galatians chapter 5 verse 17 
And uh, that won't be our key text this morning, but let me read this to you, and we've got it for you on the screen as well. The Bible says in verse 17, For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Now, notice that text of Scripture. I highlighted two words there, flesh and spirit. So that is the internal struggle, the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. Matter of fact, Paul the Apostle in Galatians chapter 4 talks about two sons of Abraham. And one of those sons was named Isaac, and the other was named Ishmael. Isaac came from Sarah, Ishmael came from Hagar. And the interesting thing about these two brothers, or half-brothers as it were, is that they literally were in competition and fighting all the days of their life. And that really becomes a picture for you and I of what it's like on the inside. In the same way that Isaac and Ishmael were always at odds, the flesh and the Spirit of God who resides within every single believer is at odds with one another. That is the internal struggle. That is the war that's raging on the inside of each one of us. But the Scripture teaches you and I that at every single moment of our lives, and don't miss this, we are surrendering either to the flesh, that is our old nature, our old way of thinking and living, which, by the way, our flesh is bent toward evil, right? Our flesh does not desire to honor God. Our flesh is self-centered. We want to do whatever's best for us to get the most out of people that we possibly can, to get the most out of this world that we possibly can. Everything kind of revolves around us. That's how our old nature thinks. But the moment you come to faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life, and now the Spirit of God produces new desires. And the desires that He produces are opposite to the desires of your flesh. And that's why you have this internal struggle. That's why Paul describes the internal struggle in Galatians chapter 5 and Romans chapter 7. But what he teaches us is that at every single moment in our lives as a believer, we are either surrendered to our old flesh the old sin nature, or we are surrendered, hands up, that is, whatever you want to do, to the Holy Spirit in our lives. And Paul says, listen, when you surrender yourself to the Spirit of God, there is going to be evidence of your surrender. And that evidence is going to be seen, listen closely, in the relationships that you have on this planet Earth. The evidences will be seen in the relationships that you have on earth. The Spirit of God is what changes us. The Spirit of God is the third member of the Trinity. He is not an it. He is a person who lives inside of you. And He produces in you a desire to honor God, to please Him. And I bought bought for just a moment, the Bible says, whoever does not have the Spirit does not know God. If you lack the desire to honor God and to live for God, it's mostly due to the fact that you've not received the Spirit of God. If you've not received the Spirit of God, you cannot claim to be a follower of God. Because the Bible says as soon as you come to faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life. And evidence of the Spirit in your life will be seen by others will be experienced by you. I wasn't going to share this, but thought I would because y'all are looking at me hard. All right, so here's the thing. I'm reading in my own devotion, 2 Corinthians, right now. As I'm reading through 2 Corinthians, I've learned something unique. The Bible says that the law of God was given to Moses in the Old Testament. God met Moses at the top of a mountain. He received the law. And when he came down off of the mountain, his face was shining. Everybody follow? Say yes. This is pretty neat. His face was shining, and the people realized that they covered his face with a veil because it was shining so brightly. But the interesting thing is that the shine that was on Moses' face kind of went away. Went away. But here's what I want you to see. The people knew that Moses had been with God because there was evidence on his face. But here's the thing. The Bible teaches in the New Testament that when you come to faith in God, that the Spirit of God takes up residence in your life. And now the evidence of you knowing God is seen by others just as it was seen in the life of Moses that he had been with the Lord. 
But the glory that was shining from his face was fading. But the glory that you, as a follower of Jesus, have is transforming you from glory to glory every single day. The longer you've known Jesus, the brighter you ought to be shining. Come on now, I'm talking. So what should be the evidences? Well, that's our key text this morning. And really will be our key text for several weeks now as we walk together through this series, Winning to War Within. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22. So I want to invite you to stand with me in honor of God's Word this morning. You've got it there in front of you. Say amen. If not, it was, this will also be on the slide behind me. But the Bible says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now I'll eyeball, eyeball for just a moment before we sit down. Every time I've read this verse in my life, uh, for many years I should say, what I do is I look at all of those attributes. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And then I say to myself, dang, I'm not doing so good in some of those. So I might look at patience and be like, I got zero patience, shall we? And then I may look at kindness and I'm like, yeah, I think I'm doing all right on that. But what I have inevitably done is wrong. I've looked at this and said, I've got to try harder. I've got to try harder, man, because I'm just not living up to that. I've got to, I've got to do better. I've got to do more. I've got to try harder to be a loving person. Try harder to be compassionate. Try harder to be... All of these things. But what if the key is not you trying harder? What if there's something else that perhaps we all have missed? That's what we want to talk about. Let's pray. Father, uh, speak to our hearts and uh, be glorified. Use the messages you see fit. Guide my heart and mind uh, to be in tune with you so that those who are present would hear uh, what you have to say, and we'll give you glory for it. And that's in Christ's name that we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. All right, so you're seated. So here they are, the list, right? Got to do better, got to do better, got to do better. Well, here's the thing. When it comes to bearing spiritual fruit, and really that's the question we want to ask, what does the Scripture teach us when it comes to bearing spiritual fruit? It's this. First of all, jot it down. Bearing fruit is not about you trying harder. It's about you trusting more. Bearing fruit is not about you trying harder. It's about you trusting more. Matter of fact, Jesus actually speaks to us in John's Gospel, chapter 15, and he tells us that we are to abide in him. He says this, listen, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, listen to this, he bears much fruit. Now, we just read the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. And now the scripture here is saying, Jesus talking, when you abide in me, you're going to bear much fruit. Now what fruit is going to show up? Well, the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness. These fruits will show up in your life as well as in my life. And then Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Now check this out. Apart from the Lord, there's nothing that we can do to be more loving to be more patient, not this kind of patience. To be more gentle, not this kind of gentleness. Apart from me, Jesus says, you cannot do anything. And then he says, my Father is glorified by this. That you would bear much fruit. So prove to be my disciple. So again, eyeball to eyeball, what is Jesus saying? It's not about you trying harder, it's about you trusting more. He says, abide in me. This is the idea of throwing your full weight of confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is your idea of trusting the Lord fully with your heart in your life. Believing He is who He said He was. And whenever we believe the Lord and we rest in Him, abide in Him, the Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit will actually show up in our life. So it's not about you trying harder. It is actually about you trusting more. You know, pretty much every morning for breakfast I have a cup of coffee and a banana. Anybody like bananas? Somebody say amen, right? All right. So anyway, I eat bananas. And if you uh, take a banana, right, you, they grow them at Walmart. don't know if you know this. But when you buy them, they're not connected to a banana tree. So if you take the banana and you take it home and you put it on your counter or whatever and you leave it there and you don't eat it, eventually it turns 
you know, a, a different color. It turns like a brownish color, and then you open it up, and it's just nasty. Are you all with me? Why? Because it's apart from its life source. Same thing for you and I as a follower of Jesus. Our life source is Jesus. If we pull ourselves away from him, we're going to discover that our lives are being led by our old nature, our flesh. But whenever we abide in Jesus, the life source, when we believe him, when we know who he is, when we grow deep in the knowledge of who he is, then, just like the banana kind of shows up by itself automatically on the banana tree, you're going to discover that the fruit of the Spirit shows up in your life automatically. It's an amazing concept. So it kind of leads me to, to, to launch out into this series. I'm going to talk on this for the next several weeks. But in your mind, here's what I want you to do. In your mind. Everybody engage your brain for a second. Put a big sheet of paper there uh, uh, in your mind and draw a line right down the dead center of the paper. Right? And on the right-hand column of the paper, y'all follow me? This side over here, I want you to jot down the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, just from top to bottom. Love, joy, peace, patience, kind of write them all down. On the left side of the page, here's what I want us to begin to do. I want us to list the attributes of the God we claim to love and the attributes of the God we claim to believe in and really ask the question, if I truly believe that that's who God is, what fruit would show up in my life? Because if I'm abiding in Him and fruit shows up, that means as I get to know God more and I really believe in who He is, then these fruit of the Spirit are going to show up in my life. For example, what do I really need to believe about God in order to bear the spiritual fruit of peace? Because it's a fruit. I'm supposed to be experiencing peace in my life. What do I really need to believe about God in order to experience joy? Because that's the fruit of the Spirit. And even a step further, what is it that I really need to believe about God? Really trust, throw all my confidence in about God in order to bear the spiritual fruit of love. You see, for you and I, it's not about us trying harder. It's not like we got to love more, we got to be more patient, i got to do better, got to work at this thing. No, no, this is what Jesus teaches as well as Paul. Instead of you trying harder, you've got to learn to trust God more. Because when you're out here trying on your own to be more loving, be more patient, etc., you're trying to muster it up by your own strength. If you could, you would not need the Spirit of God. It makes no sense for Him to place His Spirit inside of you. It's not about you over here trying, trying, trying. It's about you. What do I need to know about God? What what do I need to sink my uh, teeth of faith into? What is it I really need to believe about the Lord? And so today, I want to give you this statement, and we'll kind of hear this several times throughout the series, but the statement is this, abide in the root, the root is Jesus, and you will bear the spirit fruit in your life. Abide in the root, and you'll bear the spirit's fruit. Now this is a, a huge concept, abide in the root. And again, what does this mean? It means to know God. It means to trust Him for who He says He is and what He says He will do. It's really standing on who God is. Now, the first fruit of the Spirit here listed is love. So that's the one we're going to kind of tackle today. So jot this down in your listening guide as we continue to learn what the Scripture teaches about bearing fruit. Uh, That is, God desires you to express His love to others. God desires for you to express His love to others. Now, this is pretty huge, right? God desires for you, everybody look at me eyeball to eyeball. I appreciate you filling the blank, but look at me for a second. God desires for you to express His love to other people. Not your love, His love. Now, here's the amazing thing. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 that God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So you and I as followers of Jesus have a reservoir of love which comes from God inside of us and God wants His reservoir of love to be expressed through our lives. God wants you to express His love to other people. Now when we think about love and we think about this word used here in Galatians chapter 5, uh, sometimes we think about love and we're like, ah, anybody can do this, right? Anybody can love. Now, 
you know, even an unbeliever can love to a certain extent, and I would uh, grant you that. I mean, an unbeliever can love pizza, right? They can love their spouse. They can love their children. They probably even say, they, I love my kids. So they, they have this love. But the kind of love that is described here in Galatians 5 is a love that's on a higher plane. Uh, it, it is on a supernatural plane. This is a love that comes from the Spirit of God into your heart and flows from your life to others. This kind of love is something you can't muster up. You, you can't work this out. You can't do better and somehow attain this kind of love. It's just an impossibility. But why is that? Well, a couple of reasons. Because this love is unconditional. This love is unconditional. Now, this is the thing, right? You and I in our flesh love people conditionally, our old nature, right? So what we say is, if they treat me right, you know, I'll treat them right. They scratch my back, scratch your back. If they respond to me the way I really think they should respond, then I'm going to respond to them in a great way. So that's, that's kind of how we are wired in our flesh. And then we also are wired in our flesh to say, if they treat me wrong, I cut them off. If they take advantage of me, I hold resentment. If they don't you know, come along and do exactly what I think they should do, then I'm going to have bitterness in my life. Right? That's what our flesh does. Our flesh produces fruit of the flesh bitterness anger resentment a get back at you kind of attitude that's what our flesh produces but the love of the spirit is unconditional this kind of love says doesn't matter what you do to me i'm going to love you this kind of love also says you don't have to jump through these hoops or you know, kind of accomplish this thing to impress me so that I will love you. This kind of love shows up no matter what. This kind of love has no limit. You do me wrong, still going to love you. Do me right, still going to love you the same. Do me wrong. Sound like a song there, didn't it? Do me right. <laughs> James is always making up songs. During words, I make up songs. Do me wrong. I'm just kidding. But anyway, so here's the thing. Are y'all with me? Come here. I don't know if I'm getting hungry or what. I start losing my mind for a while. We always have this internal struggle in our lives between spirit's desire to love unconditionally and our flesh and our old nature's desire to love with condition. The bottom line is when it comes to our relationships with others, where we live, where we work, where we spend our extra time, we're always surrendered to either the Holy Spirit or we're surrendered to our flesh. If you find yourself bitter towards someone else, resentful towards someone, you got an unforgiving spirit towards somebody, then guess what? It's because you're surrendered to your flesh. This love here is unconditional. But then also this kind of love, which I think is pretty slick, this love is self-sacrificing. This kind of love that the Spirit produces in our life is a love that puts others' needs above our own. So it's not self-centered. It's not like, you know, what can you uh, do for me? This kind of love says, what can I do for you? Like, I want to help you in some form or fashion. I want to show compassion to you. I want to build you up. I want to make the most of this relationship. That's this kind of of love. And again, you know, in our flesh, right, we're just selfish. Let's just be honest, right? We want everything to kind of revolve around us. Everything to revolve around what's going to make us feel content. And if, you know, if that person in my community group continues to act that way, I'm going to drop out. Or, hey, hey, if that, if some of y'all are, can I be honest? Come here. Ricky, can I? Look at me. Here's the thing. I love Ricky. He's looking right at me. Here, here's the thing, right? Some of you came to church today and you looked around in here and you're like, can't believe they're here. Y'all don't look spiritual up in this place like you don't know what I'm talking about. You've done it. What is that? It's the flesh. It's our old nature. It's how we... That's how we come pre-programmed to operate. But the Bible says when you come to faith in Jesus, you are reprogrammed. 
You're, you're upgraded by the Spirit to love without condition. To love with a self-sacrificing kind of love. Not my needs, but yours. What can I do to help you? That's a different kind of love. And Peter tells us in the New Testament, uh, anybody can love a boss who's a good boss. But you find a boss who's treating you unfairly, and then you love that boss, how much greater glory does God receive as a result of that? Isn't this wild? So all of this is taught throughout the New Testament. So then, as we kind of look at this, we know God has this great desire for to express His love through us, we've got to ask the question, when, and here's the thing, come here, come here, come here, come here, don't miss this. When I'm having a hard time loving people, when I'm having difficulty loving people, what do I need to believe about God that's going to produce the fruit of the Spirit of love? Because it's not this. You've got to try harder. Got to try harder. Got to try, got to try. It's not doing good. You've got to do better. It's not that. It's really, this is the amazing thing. It's all tied back to what we believe about God. If I have resentment, anger, bitterness, whatever the case may be, if I feel this way towards others, it's ultimately because I'm not trusting God properly. Now, can I, can I confess my sin to you? I'm asking y'all a question. Yeah, yeah. So I came in this morning, and I got up here and I did the welcome, and y'all looked at me like this. Yeah. Y'all listen. And then I came up and I'm all excited because we're doing Sunday at the park in Habersham to share Jesus. And uh, as I was sharing it, this is what y'all did. Y'all know, y'all know what I said to myself when I sat down? These people driving me crazy. <laughs> Can't stand it. Are y'all listening? So in my flesh... I wanted to get up here and holler at y'all. What is wrong with you people? Jesus loves you. The Bible says so. <laughs> uh, so, you, so you know what I got to do? I've got to, before I even get up, you know, because y'all have already made me mad before I get up to preach. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to say, Lord, um, what do I really need to believe about you so that your love is expressed through me as I stand up and preach this morning? What do I need to believe about you? And uh, that's the last thing I think I want to write, you write down. Jot it down here because this is huge. I've got to have faith in God's love toward me. And when I, when I abide in His love towards me, that bears the spiritual fruit of love in my life. You think about, I mean, the love of God. Here's an attribute of God. When we talk about attributes, it's characteristics, right? You say, I know God. Well, tell me about Him. Well, all right. Here's what I know about God. God is loving. Matter of fact, John says in 1 John 4, 8, God is love. That's that's an awesome text. Want to know who God is? God is just love. John's so overwhelmed with the love of God, he even says in 1 John 3, 1, how great the love of the Father that He has lavished on us. This is like written with some emotion, right? He's, this love He's lavished all over us. And then He says here that we would be called the children of God. That's who we are. It's like, good night. We are kids of God. It's crazy. And John's overwhelmed by that. But this love that God has towards you and I as followers of Jesus is an unconditional love. God, look at the preacher. There's nothing you can do this morning as a follower of Jesus to get God to love you more. You can't do it. You're like, well, here's I'm, if I do this, God, he's going to love me a little more. No, you can't do anything. And then here's another truth. Uh, there's nothing that you can do to get God to love you any less. His love is unconditional. His love is constant. His love, according to John, is lavished on you. It's unconditional, but it's also sacrificial. The Bible says in John 3.16, For God so Love the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Whosoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. So He says, look, God loves you and I. 
with an unconditional, self-sacrificial kind of love. And when you abide in this love, when you really believe that God loves you this way, it changes how you treat others. Because when you have confidence in His love towards you, the Spirit of God is freed up to express love through your life. You and I crucify our old nature, not with a hammer and some nails. You and I crucify our old nature by sinking our confidence and faith in who God really is. See, abide in me, Jesus said, and you'll bear fruit. Apart from me, you can't do anything. But you abide in me, you have confidence in me, you trust in me, you grab hold of who I am and really walk that out, I'm telling you, you're going to bear fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love. So we've got to have a biblical view of who God is because here's a fact. Uh, you, you and I often have unbiblical views of God. And I, I'll be honest with you, right? There is an unbiblical view of God that I have to fight against. And that unbiblical view of God, sometimes I... And you know what I mean by this, right? So maybe you're, you're thinking about praying or thinking about worshiping or thinking about God and you kind of have this mental image show up in your mind about what He must look like. And sometimes the mental image of God that I have in my life uh, is God sitting kind of turned away from me with his arms folded like this towards me, looking down, you know, his nose at me, just disappointed in me. And so sometimes when I, when I view God, I, I think of him as like, uh, if, I, if I come to him, I want to bother him, right? So it's like, you know, I don't want to bother God. I, I don't, I don't want to, this is how I view him. But, but what if I told you that is a, radically unbiblical view of God. Because whenever you view God like this, how, how do you think you're going to relate to God? Think about your, your kids, right? So my kids, i got four of them. Let's say, um, this is how I always viewed them. I'm always looking down at them, always disappointed in them, shaking my head. Quit bothering me. Stop it. You're getting on my nerves. Garrison's going, wait a minute, I believe you have said that to me before. <laughs> right, but but, but if, this is the, if this is the overwhelming picture of God that they have, of, or, or the overwhelming picture of me that they have, what, how do you think they're going to respond? Do they want to be around me? Not at all. So the enemy wants to convince you of unbiblical pictures of God because he doesn't want you to be driven to the Lord, he wants you to be driven away from him. So what's the biblical view of God? Is it, is it this? It's like, pff, get away, you're bothering me, get on my nerves. No, the biblical view of God is this. Come here, man. I've been waiting to spend some time with you. Come here, wait, wait, wait. I just want to love you. I just want to spend time with you. That's it. That's the, now, you've got a dad who acts like that to a normal kid. The normal kid is going to run and embrace that father. Well, that's the biblical picture of God. Matter of fact, um, Chip Ingram in his book, God as He Longs for You to See Him, he writes five truths about how you and I should view God biblically. I'm just going to read these to you. Put them on your heart and mind so you can kind of have them. Listen to this. One, he says, God's thoughts, His intentions, His desires, and His plans are always for your good, never your harm. Look at the preacher. Sometimes when I view God, I'm like, He's out to get me. Right? Yeah, he, he's just waiting for the proper moment to mess me up. So what do I, I walk around scared of? That's the unbiblical view of God. The biblical view is, no, no, no. He, he's for your good, never your harm. Here's a second statement from Chip Ingram. God is kind, open, approachable, frank, and eager to be your friend. Y'all get that picture? God is eager to be your friend. It's pretty slick. When I was a little kid, I had, a, I had a, a neighbor dude that went to school with me, and he was eager to be my friend. Every day he'd come over. Can Levi come out and play? And I'd be hiding over in the corner. Tell him no. I can't do it. Tell him no. <laughs> Can you imagine? Every day you wake up, God's like, come here. I just, 
just want to spend time with you. I just want to be your friend. I'm eager to be your friend. Here's, here's another one. Uh, Chip Ingram says, God emotionally identifies with your pain, your joy, your hopes, and dreams. He's chosen to allow your happiness to affect his own. Number four, he says, God takes pleasure in you just for who you are, completely apart from your performance. Completely apart from your accomplishments. And then I like this one. God is actively and creatively orchestrating people, circumstances, and events to express his affection and selective correction to provide for your highest good. Here's the thing. When you and I really sit down in that reality... And we really believe God loves us like this. Like this is God's relationship to me. This is how God loves me. If I, if I abide in that love, if I really have confidence in that love, you know what's going to happen? The Holy Spirit is going to immediately begin to love others through me. As God is toward me, I will be towards others. How can I hold a grudge against that person? When God doesn't hold a grudge against me. How can I retaliate towards that person? When God doesn't retaliate towards me. How can I be unforgiving towards that individual? When God's not unforgiving towards me. When I abide in his love. Remember Jesus says abide in me. And I in you. And you will bear fruit. And what's the fruit? Through the spirit. Love. There's always that battle, isn't there? So whenever you have that war raging on the inside, the question is, who am I going to surrender to now? My flesh or the Spirit of God? When I have this battle on the inside towards, you know, loving someone, Jesus even says, you know, love your enemies, which is just crazy. You mean love my enemies? Are you joking me? I ought to be pounding my enemies. No, love your enemies. That's what Jesus said. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love them, love them, love them. But whenever I have this issue, and it's like, and y'all know the issue. There are some people who are just flat out hard to love. Come on now. If y'all can't think of anybody, it's because you the one that's hard to love. See it? Right? Hard to love. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to abide in his love. How can we kind of grow deep in that? Well, first of all, and this is kind of to wrap up the whole message this morning. But uh, first of all, you have to be in a relationship with God. You've got to be in a relationship with God. Uh, apart from a relationship with the Lord, uh, bottom line is you cannot express this kind of love. But God created you to know Him, loves you, wants, He's eager to be your friend. Right? He wants you in a relationship with Him. But He knows your sin cannot be accepted in His presence. So God... Sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sin. You ought to die for your sin, but Jesus died for you. Was buried and raised again. And the Bible says, when you, check this out, have faith in the Lord, you will be forgiven from the penalty of your sin. Death will no longer hold you. Life will embrace you. The Spirit of God will indwell you. You cannot know this kind of love apart from a relationship with God. And you cannot express this kind of love apart from a relationship with God. Secondly, I would say to you, if you want to really grow, tr- grow in your trust in God's love, you've got to get in God's Word and be overwhelmed by His love. Get in His Word. Listen, God wrote a book and it's called the Bible. And this is God's voice to you and to me. And God has used His Word to speak about the depth, the length, the breadth of His love towards you. Right? When you spend time with God in His Word, God speaks to your heart. You're overwhelmed by the fact He would take up any time with you. Before we moved here, uh, we lived in a house. I used to do my devotion down next to the staircase, kind of in another room. And uh, I would sit Indian style. I, you can't say that anymore, can you? Crisscross applesauce, y'all with me? So I would, forgive me, politically correct. I'm plieing right now is what I'm doing. But anyway, so... <laughs> I know. I'm amazed I can do this as well. It must be the Lord. But so anyway, I would sit down before the Lord, you know, on the floor and uh, be talking to the Lord, etc. And then one time, uh, Garrison doesn't know this. He was a little kid. Garrison came walking down the stairs. I didn't even hear him. But as I'm doing my devotion, Garrison just came over and plopped down in my lap like I wasn't doing nothing. I was just sitting there. But then it dawned on me. 
Every time I have a devotion, I'm doing this to God. Just plopping down in his lap, saying, Lord, thank you for loving me. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? This is how we should view God, because this is the biblical way to view God. Here's another thing. Uh, be thankful for God's love. Uh, and then number four, I would just say it like this. I've got to be quick here. Ask God to love others through you. You know, there's somebody hard to love, possibly, that you live with. There might be somebody hard to love that you work with. And maybe, maybe there's a neighbor who's hard to love, right? So eyeball to eyeball, what do you pray? It's like, God, my flesh doesn't want to love this person. So I need to surrender to the Spirit. And I need to rest in the fact that you love me without condition. And God, and this is, this is how I've been praying lately. God, as you are to me, let me be to others. Father, thank you uh, for our time together in your word today. And Lord, as we kind of walk through these um, attributes of who you are in the weeks ahead, as we walk through the fruit in the weeks ahead, help us, God, to, to see that when we abide in the root, we bear the Spirit's fruit. Help us to really put this into play in our lives. And Father, I just imagine what would our church look like if we expressed this kind of love to one another. Or Lord, I imagine what kind of uh, homes would we be living in if we expressed this kind of love to our spouse, to our children. What kind of neighborhoods, what kind of community difference would this kind of love make? And so Father, we pray that you would allow us not to try harder, but to trust more. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, you may be here today and the fact is you can't express this kind of love yet because you don't have a relationship with God. But today you're like, man, I want to step over the line of faith and I want to, I want to trust God. I want to come into a relationship with Him. And let me encourage you right where you are, uh, if you'll just pray something like this in your heart as I pray out loud, just say, God, I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. And so today I'm turning from my sin and I'm placing my full trust in you. Thank you for Jesus who died for me. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for newness of life that you give. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, if you're here today and you say, Levi, that's the prayer of my heart. And the first step of obedience is baptism. We celebrated two baptisms last service. We're going to celebrate two more next service. We would love to set up a time for you to be baptized in the days ahead. And so listen, if that's your prayer, in a moment we're going to stand to our feet and as we stand up and begin to sing, you just leave the place where you're seated right now. Come forward, grab me by the hand or one of these others who will be standing with me and just say, hey, I gave my life to Christ today. Or God may be calling you to join this church family, get plugged into what he's doing here. If that's the case, you'd be obedient to the Lord as well. But most of all, let me just challenge you this week just to spend time trusting in God's love and anytime you have a little resentment a little unforgiveness a little bitterness a little anger a little hatred start kind of stirring up on the inside of you that is the moment that you've got to sit down and put your full confidence in God's love towards you because as he is towards you so you should be to others Father, uh, place your hand upon our fellowship. Help us to grow uh, in the knowledge of your love. And may we surrender to the Spirit of God so that your love is expressed through our life. And Father, I pray you'd give courage to those who need to make their decisions public today as we sing. And that's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. While we sing, you come if God's calling you. You come on. I was lost. I was in chains, the world had a hold of me. My heart was a stone, I was covered in shame when he came for me. I couldn't run, couldn't run from his presence. I couldn't run, couldn't run from His arms. Jesus, He loves me. He loves me. He is for me. And 
Jesus, how can it be? He loves me. He is for me. Just have our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning. Uh, Father, you love us unconditionally. And God, for that we are overwhelmed and grateful. And God, we also thank you that you have modeled to us what love looks like in sacrifice. Uh, Father, you're, uh, you're modeling through your son to us of serving others is tremendous. And giving up his own life so that we can be in relationship with you. And Father, the reality is now we express your love to others. And so God, we need the filling of the Holy Spirit. We need Him to take control of our heart and lives. And God, I'm trusting in the days ahead we will continue to experience this in our life. And God, you'll use this series of messages to challenge us in the depth of our knowledge of you. And we'll give you glory for it. And that's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You be seated.